and was not allowed to eat meat until after the flood. He could only have vegetation here, which means that's all the animals ate. Which means that in those 290 above remaining cars, which we discussed before, there would have been loaded just tons of all types of plants and vegetables and fruits bearing seeds and all types of things like that. Now you say, well, they would have been on there a whole year. Uh, things begin to grow old after a while. The salad wilts after too long. You got to keep in mind another fact. The decay procedure was not heightened like it is today. With the progress of time, the effects of the fall, we've said that before, the effects of the fall have become greater. Shown clearly in the fact that man after the fall lived hundreds and hundreds of years. Long after the fall doesn't do that today. Which means that these effects of decay, whether decay on humanity or decay on the vegetable kingdom, were not as pronounced back then as they are today. Which means you probably could have cut an apple and just let it sit there for months, maybe for years, and it would not have rotted on you. After a process of time, uh, hundreds of years later, as these effects become more profound upon all of God's creation, then as you know with us today, things like that can't be done. Uh, you just cut your salad and leave it in your bowl too long, and it just begins to wilt on you all of a sudden. You've got to do everything you can to keep everything fresh. Refrigerate all your vegetables to keep them fresh. Just leave them sitting out for a while. Mm -hmm. And they rot just like that if you don't watch out. Mm -hmm. So if we keep some of these not only scriptural but some of these scientific things in mind, again, uh, we're overcoming these problems very easily without having to grasp for straws or dodge the critics' bullets whenever they're shooting them at us concerning, well, what do the animals eat? They ate just tons of vegetables and fruits and leaves and uh, just all types of things, grass that could have been cut and weeds and just all types of things that could have been cut and gathered by Noah. And you remember he had 120 years to do it and stored on however many of the 290 cars left. Now remember, you don't actually have box cars, but you've got that much space left on the ark. So he had had that much space to store, or part of that much space to store all of his food. Going on to a third aspect of the care of the animals, what did they drink? Anyone want to take an answer here? Water. 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 Very good. You're catching on. They drank water. <laughs> well, you have to wonder where some people's minds are. What did they drink? Well, what are you going to drink? Apples? <laughs> Obviously, they drank water. Well, we're being a little mean towards them. Uh, they don't mean to ask the question that way, but it's always good to make the foolish appear just as foolish as they really are. What did they drink? They drank water. Well, how in the world did they get enough water for this many animals to keep on the ark? Could have gotten it from two sources. First of all, they could have gotten water uh, from the ocean itself. They had to have been here last week to understand that. Salt content, no problem. Oh, it might have been a little salty. Uh, but back in the days when you used to gargle, uh, that wasn't just too terrible. As long as you didn't put too much salt in it, you, you could still swallow it down. It wouldn't kill you or anything. You wouldn't want to put uh, you know, too much of that uh, Epsom salt in there. But the ocean would not have been as salty. So very obviously could have let buckets down over the edge and drawn up water. Of course, that'd be a little difficult to do. It'd be a lot of buckets and a lot of drawing up to satisfy the mm -hmm. thirst of all of them. So there's another way they could have gotten water, and that is from the rain. Mm -hmm. First 40 days, you've got enough of it to cover the whole globe. <laughs> well, that ought to be enough to drink for a while. Yeah. <laughs> Well, what about some of the practical aspects of this? Well, Noah very easily could have constructed some type of system. Remember, you've got an ark now longer than a football field, and the best place to catch water, some of you are too young, uh, not that I'm any older than you, but unless you've studied or unless you're older, you don't know how you used to get water in the olden days. You got it off your roof. You had a barrel that you stored outside. I've been places where that's where we got our water. 
You go to your more primitive places. Anyone ever been there to a place? Yeah. yeah. And you have uh, you have your barrel out there, and it catches it off the roof. It runs in a certain place and fills that barrel up, and there's your water. Yeah. I mean, if you don't have a well or a pump or something like that or a spring around, well, that's where you get your water. So, very obviously, he could have done the same thing, constructed some system like a gutter system that would have caught the water off the roof, would have run it through hollow pipes, I mean, made out of boards that they could have easily hollowed out, run into the ark, and run into some of these nests where you've got special containers or tanks prepared to store just tons and tons of water in there. Now, it had to stay there a whole year. Any problem with evaporation? No. The atmosphere is saturated with water. It's not going to evaporate any of your water there. It's got as much water as it can contain. I mean, it's going to start evaporating the ocean before it bothers with your little tanks that you've got inside the ark. So you could have had also, you see, these are easy answers, aren't they? With 291 cars left, oh, you could use half of them for food and fill half of them up with water. Some of these nests that are mentioned here in chapter 6 and verse 14, since you know, we've already said before, that the only way that the door could have been properly closed would, would have been for God to have closed it from the outside and for him to have pitched it from the inside. You see, all these details give us ideas of what he did, which means that he must have had pitch on board with him once he got inside. Which means if he hadn't done it before, probably he had not he could have picked up some of those stalls, made tanks out of them, and just filled them up with gallons and gallons and gallons of water. And uh, the ark had plenty of room to hold all the animals, to hold uh, all the food for the animals, to hold all the water. Uh, it's just that uh, you have to be ingenious like Noah was with his directions that God gave him. Ingenious carpenter and architect here to be able to arrange some, arrange some type of system whereby you could catch all that water. I mean, you couldn't just stick your hand or a bucket out the window and catch some water there. You're going to have to have some full-scale, major operation in order to catch that water and bring it inside. And for it raining, as we say, cats and dogs for 40 days and 40 nights, oh boy, you've got a lot of water you could catch there. <laughs> and with the size of the ark, and which means with the size of the roof of the ark, which is like several hundred houses put together, you can fill up quite a few rain barrels full of water with that. So what did they drink? Uh, answer to that is they drank water. Another aspect of the care of the animals, and the most difficult one, is how did he individually care for all of the animals? This is our most serious question. Even if we... And our critics grant that the ark could have contained all the animals, all the food, and all the water. How in the world did he individually care for them? It's been suggested by one writer that Noah had a special ointment of oil where all you needed was one drop per day per animal. And it, would, it was a knockout drug. It would, it would put him out completely. <laughs> And it would take care of his animals. Now, I'm not saying that couldn't be the case, you see. That could be. You and I don't know. We didn't live on that side of the flood. People have been looking for the fountain of youth. Maybe there was a fountain back then that he got some oil out of. I hasten to add, I kind of doubt that that's the case, but um, I don't have any problem with that. If I couldn't dream up any other reason or any other way, I'd say that's probably right then. <laughs> Something had to happen. He had to care for 50,000 animals and a million insects. I mean, to make sure that they're all tucked in bed on time, that's a big responsibility, <laughs> even with uh, four women on board. <laughs> and four men, too. <laughs> that's still a big responsibility. Now, one fellow in his book uh, wants to point out the fact that um, the animals, being from diverse regions, some need uh, cool, moist climate and moist places, and some need uh, dry, humid climate. But what he is forgetting is that there were no distinctions on the earth between moist areas and dry areas. It was all the same climate. Now, this can be proven from back in chapter 1 and verse 31. There were no barren polar caps and barren Sahara and Mojave deserts out there. And neither were there great exceedingly high mountains where nothing lives at the top of mountains. 
I mean, if you've got mountains like that, barren of all life, when the very purpose for God creating the earth is so he could populate the earth. Once he created it, we're back to without form and void, or we're back to unfilled and unformed. He wanted to create the earth so that he could first of all form it, and after he formed it, then you go into the verses in Genesis 1 that says that he filled the earth. And he's not going to create polar caps and barren deserts where nothing lives or where only a few items or a few animals live. And you hardly can make the statement God does in verse 31 of Genesis 1. If most of the earth was covered by polar caps and high mountains and deserts, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Now, can you look at the Sahara Desert and say, behold, that is very good? No, you can, can't say that in your right mind. There's something abnormal and something wrong with the Sahara Desert. And when you go to a region like that, when you go to the very tip top of a mountain where you get up high enough, of course, there's not the availability of oxygen and you've got what you call your timber line. And I mean the trees stop just about even and there are no trees past that. They can't survive. You can't get up there and say, behold, this is very good. It's a barren wasteland up there. The same is true with the North and South Pole. I mean, when you've got places on the earth that dip over 150 degrees below zero, you can't say, oh, the whole very good. You certainly wouldn't want to be there. <laughs> or when places that get 130 degrees above zero, or you couldn't say, the whole very good. You'd say, both of those, the whole very bad. I like something right in between. Well, that's what we've got in the creation account. That's what we've got here with Genesis. You don't have very cold. You don't have very hot. So it's no problem with some animals needing a dry climate and some needing a cool climate. And since he didn't have incubators and fans and uh, things like this on the ark and he couldn't have provided it for them, they didn't need that provided for them. But they do have to have individual care. Well, we can answer this in one of two ways. How did he individually care for them? First of all, there could have been some special new capacities uh, imparted to all of the animals. <coughs> which we know to be, the to, to be the account that took place at this time. And that special capacity, first of all, which has already been granted prior to this time, is that peculiar, uh, indescribable, uh, it can't really be defined, it can't really be analyzed uh, aspect and characteristic known as migration. How did all those animals come to him in the first place? You see, we've answered just that God sent them there supernaturally. Well, we can give you a little more in-depth answer. That was probably the time at which God imparted to all animals the sense of migration. Uh, we've got birds and we've got fish today that migrate thousands of miles to a pinpoint spot every single year. Don't ever fail. Uh, you couldn't find your way there with a road map. And even if you had one, you're lost half the time. I mean, when you go on a trip, you've got a road map that tells you how to get there. How many times do you actually get there on time? Well, this sign was turned around backwards, and so you went down the wrong road. They don't have any signs turned around backwards. Uh, they get there at the, at the precise moment uh, sometimes. Not all of them do that, but they all get back to a certain place. They migrate. Of course, this has to do with the heat and the cold that we have today. They migrate uh, to these various regions depending on the heat and the cold, which tells them some things about their own body. Uh, namely, it's time to begin to reproduce. So here they go back to a certain area. No signs to get there, no road map to get there, but they always get back there. So it's something that's been supernaturally imparted. But listen, they had no need of that in the beginning, you see. In the beginning of creation, you've got no need to escape the cold to go and reproduce or to escape the heat. Everything is uniform. You've got no need of this sense of migration. So he could have put it in the animals at this time, and, or at least put it in the animals that eventually came to the ark and gave them a sense of migration that led them directly to the ark. That's the only way that you can adequately explain it. This would have been, of course, in them permanently, and it would have been passed on to the animal's descendants once they got out of the ark. As they reproduced in this inborn instinct that we call migration, which really you can hardly define what it is, and you can't explain what it is. It just works for them all the time, though. Uh, would have been passed on. 
Now, a second aspect or characteristic that probably was given to them at this time also is known as hibernation. Now, when you say hibernation, generally the first thing that comes to your mind is, is bears. Uh, but bears are only one species that hibernate. There are many different animals. Ground squirrels. There's one particular bird, the poo-wheel. Uh, hedgehog. Many different types of fish experience the exact same thing called hibernation when the lakes are frozen over. Not all fish, but many different types experience the same thing where they lower their body temperature almost to zero. And they're almost dead. I mean, for practical purposes, they're dead. But they manage to exist. Um, just the well-known bear, the bears that do hibernate. Not all of them do all the time, but a lot of our bears here in this country, in uh, Yellowstone <coughs> Park, in Montana, in that region, and of course on up into Canada and Alaska, they do hibernate. And they can lower their body temperature, they store up a lot of fat, lower their body temperature, slow their heartbeat down, slow their pulse temp, um, uh, lower their blood rate, their blood pressure rate and everything. They can do all of that without, you know, pushing a button. It just happens for them at a certain time. And so it's only likely that this probably is what took place with most of the animals to a large degree on board the ark. Now, what this tells us right away is there's no problem with having to care for all the animals. They're asleep most of the time. Now, the critics hate this answer, but I think it's an excellent one. doesn't mean that they slept the whole year long because all your animals that hibernate don't sleep the whole time. They sleep a while, wake up, eat, exercise, drink, go back to sleep. That's why you need all the food. That's why you need all the water on board. Even for those that are hibernating during uh, a long period of time, when it comes time to wake up, they're going to have to have food. They're going to have to have water to continue. So it only makes sense that this would have been the case. Another thing that's studied along with hibernation is called estivation. Um, which is really just the reverse. It is animals in hot climates being able to uh, more or less hibernate, except it's called estivate. If you're in a hot climate, it's estivation. If it's in a cold climate, it's hibernation. But animals who live in desert regions can estivate and practice estivation during a time of extreme heat and severe drought. And therefore, they don't need water, they don't need heat, or they don't need to be out getting... Uh, catching their food, therefore they don't have to be out in the climate where it's hot and where the, the, uh, the drought is all over the land. They can get down in a burrow in the ground and estivate just like a, a bear can hibernate. Uh, both of these things are remarkably similar, it just depends on uh, in which climate you find yourself. So it appears to be the case that this is what was imparted to the animals and most of your animals are simply going to be sleeping most of the time. Uh, Ram, in his book, makes a mockery of the fact that just carrying the manure away of all the animals would overtax the eight people that were on board. But if you're sleeping six months at a time, there's not that much manure to be carried away. And you see, again, that's why we need some extra room. That's where the manure would head if it got too much, I guess, in one of the cells. That's where it head, back to one of those extra rooms there. But if you're only waking up once every couple of months and only eating once every couple of months, there's really not a big problem of excess weight to be collected all around. So that's one way that we can answer the question, how did he individually care for them? They were not like monkeys at the zoo, just clattering and clanging all the time when you had to go and feed them and water them on a daily schedule or twice or three times a day. No such thing. Uh, that would have been utterly impossible to do. When you've got something that large with a million different animals on board, Obviously, he and his friends can't spend all their time running around day and night. Some animals sleep at night, some in the day, trying to find out who's awake and who's hungry. Mm -hmm. So they had to have been in some form of suspended uh, living where they would have lowered their these various characteristics of their bodily features, thereby not needed so much individual care from Noah and from the other people on board the ark. Now the other hint uh, that we have concerning exactly how this was taken care of is seen in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 1. How did Noah care for the animals? 
we first of all given the answer of migration, hibernation, and estivation. And although these two could be placed together because we're really not told what chapter 8 and verse 1 means, uh, we separate it because it is a specific text that again our critics are overlooking some very important words and important texts in the flood account to help us understand how some of these insurmountable problems can indeed be surmounted. Genesis 8.1 This verse contains a particular Hebrew word zekar, Z-A-K-A-R which is the word translated remembered in Genesis 8.1 and the BDB lexicon gives it the meaning of granting requests, protecting, and delivering. In other words, it means more than a reversal of one's forgetfulness. It means much more. In other words, it doesn't even include, include a reversal of one's forgetfulness. Now with that in mind, let's take a look at the verse. And God, in the Hebrew word, is zikar. And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all cattle that was with him in the ark. Now, it's not using the word in the fact that God had forgotten them and now he remembered them. It's using it as the BDB gives the meaning, protecting, delivering, and granting requests. Now, that's saying a whole lot when it says that God remembered the animals on board. Not forgetfulness, but delivering, protecting, and granting requests. Let me show you several other places where the same word is used and where it has a similar meaning. Genesis 19 and verse 29. We'll look at several passages here. Then came to pass, I guess you have to remember Genesis 18 and 19 up until this point to understand the verse. Then it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in the which Lot dwelt. He hadn't forgotten Abraham, but he's using the word remember in the BDB meaning of delivering, protecting, and granting requests. He did, in other words, what Abraham wanted to do. When it says that he remembered him, he answered the prayers here of Abraham, answered his longings and his desires by saving Lot. So the word is used in the very same way that it's used earlier in the same book. Uh, Exodus uh, chapter 2, verses 23 and 24. And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died. The children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. It's a special usage of the word remember here. 1 Samuel 1, 19. We've got the same word here occurring again. They rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife and the Lord remembered her. Oh, Delivered, protected, oh, granted the request that Hannah had offered to him previously. And of course over the New Testament it be a different word but the same usage in Luke 23 and verse 42 is a similar usage of, of at least our English word, remember. The thief on the cross said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. So it's using the word as the Hebrew word, zikar, is used in these various other passages at which we've looked. So that I think that takes care of individual care. If God himself is remembering all the animals, then that takes care of the animals there. Mm -hmm. Exactly how it was done in every case, we don't have to know, as long as we know that he protected, delivered, and granted requests, not only of Noah, but of all the animals also.
So when you take uh, Genesis 8.1 in consideration with the three themes of migration, hibernation, and excavation, then we don't have any problem with Noah and the seven others on board the ark spending day and night, breaking their back, climbing from one floor to another to take care of all the animals. Oh, we got a couple of more subjects here under the same thing. Next thing we come to is reproduction. I mean, when you get animals together like that so the male doesn't have to chase the female, uh, it makes reproduction rather easy. Mm -hmm. But was there reproduction on board the ark? No reproduction at all. Genesis chapter 8, verses 15 through 19. I think it's rather clear from the text and rather obvious from the statements that God makes here concerning the animals and their reproductive responsibilities that reproduction both for animals and for humans, by the way, did not take place on board the ark. Obviously, you've got uh, the four men and the four women, and they come off four men and four women, uh, not a couple of extras tagging along behind. So there's no reproduction of humans, in like manner, there's no reproduction of animals. That could have been one of the things taken care of in the fact that God remembered them. Simply could have been uh, that bodily function retained so that there was no reproduction. If they slept the whole time, there's no time for reproduction. So that takes care of the problem too. How all these things were done, for each individual case, we don't know. But we've got enough answers to choose from, though, you see. It's not that we don't have any answers. We've got plenty of answers. Which one answers each case, we're not at the liberty to say. We weren't on board. We didn't have a tape recorder and a television camera to watch and record everything that took place. Oh, yeah. But we've got ample answers to answer any ample questions that people raise about that. So we see, we'll start with verse 15, not even multiplying rabbits multiply. God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. No mention of children. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee of all flesh, both of fowl, cattle, every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, because now it is time to breed abundantly in the earth and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. Second half of verse 17 implies there was no reproduction prior to that. It's not until after they're brought out. When they're given this command, now it's time to reproduce and multiply and fill up the earth. Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him, every beast, every creeping thing, every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds went forth out of the ark. Now, if hibernation was not the case for all of them, and if uh, the, the, the particular period during which the, the female is fertile uh, was, re was restrained by God, then we've always got our Genesis 6, 14 text of the nest to fall back on. He could have separated the males from the female mm -hmm. and therefore uh, blocked any uh, type of reproduction that would have taken place between the animals. So you see, any one of those cases uh, can be selected to answer this. What about, I don't know what number this is, but we're on another one, our last one here this evening. What about some of the unique animals, what we call the unique animals? Uh, we've got two categories. First of all, what about those that require both water and land? Such as things like uh, frogs and crocodiles. Frogs got to have water and he's got to have land. Crocodiles need water and they need land. What about these? Would they have been uh, just left outside the ark or taken on board? Only the animals that needed nothing but water would have been left outside the ark. If you had a total need or a partial need for land, then you'd have to be included in the ark which would include alligators and crocodiles and frogs and salamanders and things that take water and can live on land. We can fall back, thank the Lord, for Genesis 6.14 on our nest again. He could have built special tanks so they could live in the water and so they can get up on the land and stay too. That would have been easy to do. You don't have to have 1,500 crocodiles, just two in there. 
He could have built a little shelf. They could have gotten in the water if they wanted to. There would have been their, their uh, drink right there to satisfy the thirst. Then when they wanted to hibernate for a couple of months, come back up on land or up on a shelf that he would have built for them, they could have lived up there a while. So we've got our, our nest back in Genesis 6.14 again as a handy text to pull out of the back pocket. And then finally, what about Behemoth and all those other great dinosaurs? Some of them were as tall as the ark. Well, nowhere in the text does it say you have to take full-grown, mature animals. Why not take babies? young, immature animals. You don't need a brontosaurus that's uh, 500 years old on board. You would have to have a special stall for his neck. <laughs> Same is true as a giraffe. Let's assume that there wasn't enough space even on the first floor. Remember, we've talked about the division, and probably you've got a higher ceiling on the first floor and lower as you work your way up. What if there wasn't a high enough ceiling, enough room even on the, the ground level, the first floor, to contain the giraffe? You don't have to have a full-grown one there. Mm -hmm. You could have a young one, obviously. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you'd have a male and female young one, and they would reproduce whenever they came out. Um, <coughs> one thing I can mention back up there on reproduction, if God was concerned about space, evidently he's not concerned about space. The animals and the number of the animals presents no problem at all. But think about this. If that was a problem, then he's going to be trying to work that out some way. If it was a problem of putting all the animals on board this little silly boat that's going to be floating around. But if that were the problem, and he's trying to work it out, he could easily have taken, and he could have done this just as easily as not, only taken pregnant females on board. And of course, animals, they have like a half a dozen when it's time to give birth. And whenever the animal gave birth, you wouldn't even need any males. All you need is just one female of each species that's pregnant, Got to have all of them pregnant, get them on board, and keep the, uh, we'll call them children, in there until the end of the experience. And then whenever they come out, uh, then you'll have three girls and three boys, and there goes the species repopulating itself. Now, obviously that's not what happened. He said take male and female on board. But what I'm saying is it must not be a problem with the animals, or he wouldn't have done it that way. To save space, he would have said, leave all males out and take only pregnant females. Mm -hmm. So space is no problem. Or he would not have done that in the first place. Um, let me say something else. Then if you've got questions, we'll take those questions. And I think I'll be through anyway. Um, considering we're back on the number of the animals, that's what just makes people hair stand on end when you actually <laughs> assume that yes the flood was universal and he had representatives of all the animals on board what you got to remember is that at that day we don't it's obviously I'm, I started to say we don't necessarily have to have had but we definitely did not have the number of species that we have today now there, it's absolutely impossible to define exactly what the kinds mean I mean, when you get into taxonomy, what is a family, what is a kind, what is a genus, what is a species, that gets very complicated. Mm -hmm. What Genesis 1 is talking about when it says he made a certain kind seed in itself to reproduce after his kind, we don't know exactly, according to modern taxonomy, where the dividing line would be. But since the year 1700, there have been 500 varieties of the sweet pea made. You can hardly buy it. A pea at the store, I'm talking about a sweet pea, and it might not say it on the package. It might, some of them will say hybrid, some of them don't. But from one variety of sweet pea, since 1700, in the last 200 or the last 300 years, there have been produced 500 hybrid kinds of sweet pea. In the last several hundred years, there have been produced 200 different types of dogs from a few simply wild dogs. So when we say he took one of every kind or two of every kind, that doesn't mean a Doberman, a Collie, a German Shepherd, Daffin Hound, and all these different things, a uh, St. Bernard, a Peekapoo, whatever kind is your favorite kind. He didn't take one of all those. He took a male dog and a female dog. 
Right. Or maybe there were five different. We, but we don't have to assume 200 different. Five, the five different types of dogs, five meats, females, five males, and they have been crossbred to produce all these various kinds that we have today. Right. You see, that's true not only in the plant kingdom, but it's true in the animal kingdom. So we don't have to assume that we've got all these kinds back then. Now, what Genesis 1 says is that you should not be crossbreeding. It says let a kind produce after its kind. So I highly recommend that you know people should not be in a business like that. Uh, you can hardly help the fact that you buy crossbred things because everything is crossbred today to produce things that are more disease resistant and that taste better. Those are the basic two reasons why things are crossbred. You want to cut down the possibility of disease, trying to fight back with the fall now, uh, the fall of man and the disease that's in the world. You're trying to stop that. Man's highly success successful in a lot of ways. He crossbreeds all these peas and beans and gets something that you just you couldn't kill with an ass. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, God sends a tornado along this fellow's orchard and he manages to kill one or two things. Amen. Of all these, that things are going to circumvent the effects and the results of the fall. And why do you think we've got all the flooding that we have that destroys, and the frost, past the season down in Florida, that destroys millions of dollars worth of citrus fruit and produce? Amen. Why do you think we have all that going on? Man has gotten out of his role. God said clearly in Genesis 1, its seed is within itself and it is to produce after its kind, not crossbred and produce some kind that I didn't intend in the beginning. So that's why we have severe drought out in California. And now you pay, uh, I don't know how much, just to get an orange from somewhere. Or wherever uh, species has been where you've got some tremendous catastrophe. And whenever a frost a late frost hits the citrus production down in Florida, uh, this whole country. You read about it in newspapers, it's in news broadcasts. Uh, the whole country is aware of the fact yeah. that frost has hit Florida because there goes all of our citrus fruit down there. Or if floods, earthquakes, mudslides, tornadoes hit California. Why does it always hit Florida and California? I mean, we don't have mud <laughs> mudslides hit Minnesota here. Yeah. Just destroying all of our citrus fruit. And there goes our prices up. Because man has been so ingenious that he's cross-breeding these things. He didn't like the way things tasted in the beginning. And they probably began to lose their taste after the fall. So he begins to get everything cross-bred. And now, like I say, we were at the store the other day to buy some, uh, some various things to plant out in the garden. You can hardly buy anything that's not a hybrid. And like I say, even if it says on the package it's not a hybrid, generally what those mean is that it's a recent hybrid. And they'll give you the university, Cornell University, uh, University of Georgia, some professor at a university that's produced this hybrid that's now resistant to a certain disease or that now is resistant to frost. And you can plant it early or late depending on whether you live in the north or south. Or that will give you a greater produce. That's another reason why they crossbreed. Didn't produce enough before. <laughs> Not enough peas in the pot. There's only four. So they can get some crossbred that will produce eight peas in the pot. Bigger strawberries, bigger eggplants. Man's been able to do this, you see. But that's not God's original plan in the beginning. Uh, but what I'm saying in all this is the fact that we simply don't have to believe that we had as many kinds around back then as we have today. Since the facts of experience in history prove to us that the dogs, the peas, and I could say a lot of other things that we have today did not exist 200, 300 years ago. You just didn't have things. So like black-eyed peas, you just didn't have things like that. And you've got so many different types of, of corn. Most of your corn is hybrid corn. Your yellow corn, your white corn, your Indian corn, your popcorn. All that can be grown. Where do you get all that corn? God didn't have to in, in, invent and create all these different types of corn back in the beginning. But when you begin to get them cross-spread, then when you produce all the different kinds, which would have taken place after Noah's day, which means that maybe only he only had to have four dogs and four cats on board, because that's all the kinds of cats and dogs. Maybe only one, you see. Right. Yeah. I mean, couldn't be less than one, 
But it might not be any more than just one, a male and female of each kind. Okay, we got any questions after this? I believe you were first over here. The um, possibility of having immature individuals also would eliminate the reproduction uh, problem. That's true. If they were all immature individuals, they wouldn't be reproducing naturally, I assume, even if they were having any. If you get immature ones, which whenever it's uh, speaking of large animals, there's no need in assuming anything but immature animals. It cuts down on need for food, need for water, need for the carrying away of manure and everything. Mm-hmm. Matter of balance on the earth. You were saying before about the water being brackish. Brackish water can be drank, right? Mm-hmm. And if you were to take the earth and you said 500, box cars. I mean, you fill it with any of the boxes, that many cubic feet with water, and then you've got so many other cubic feet filled up with uh, with animals. How would that fall in the balance? You know, as far as the, the arc itself floating. Oh, yeah. you so many, you got to have so much air around something. You know, right. For flotation. Well, see, we've discussed before what the gross tonnage was. It's around fourteen thousand gross tons. Now, gross tonnage means the amount of water that's displaced whenever you sink something in water. So the gross tonnage, which was around 14,000 tons, would have been just the perfect right, ma- right amount whenever the ark would have been fully loaded to take care of any of these problems like that. There wouldn't have been problems, in other words. That would have all been taken into consideration in the construction of the ark. You've got to get it with a certain weight and with a certain capacity uh, in order to meet these requirements of things like that. Okay, then was the rainwater they were drinking, supposing it was coming off the roof, wouldn't that, that happen the same water as that would have been in the ocean considering the evaporation? You, what do you mean the same? Uh, suppose that no one uh, dipped a cup in the ocean or a pail or whatever. Uh, wouldn't that water that he had just dipped out of the ocean or the sea, or, wouldn't that have been the same as the rainwater considering the evaporation? Well, it would have been very close, but um, you've got to keep in mind the fact that as far as we know, we, this can't be proven, but as far as we know that the seas and the oceans of that day were salt water. And so if they were, and you've got a mixing of the fresh water with the salt water, then you're going to have a higher salt content than what you'd have as far as the water that came off the roof. Which what we said last time was that the salt content would not have been too high where you could not have drunk the water. But the water off the roof would have tasted, if you like fresh water, would have been more like fresh water. Um, what, what took you away from the flying off the window and the Back to our nest again. Nest with lattices over the front. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You see, all the nests could have been enclosed like that, just to keep the animals, whenever they woke up from their six-month nap, from wandering next door, just to keep them closed. But there would have been lattice work over, you know, one wall or somewhere to provide light and air and ventilation for them. See, I was wondering uh, if, uh, if at the time before the fall, uh, if these animals weren't eating each other, how did they control the reproduction? Was it just a real world reproduction? Oh no. You see, there was a very high reproduction rate. You're talking about before the fall? Right. How would you have a checks and balances? You know, so you just wouldn't have to do anything. Oh, there is no check. <laughs> no, there's no need for a check, you see. The world is perfect in that day. Nothing goes wrong until man sins. And then when you begin to be presented with your problem. And besides that, there's not enough time, you see. There's not very much time between creation and the fall. So you've got mass reproduction. That's the command in chapter 1. Everything reproduced. And the animals begin to reproduce. But there's not that much time between prior uh, to the fall and the fall. So you're not going to have, you know, the whole world all of a sudden overpopulated with animals. And afterwards, then you've got your check. They do begin to eat. You see what I'm saying? There's not a very great time period between Genesis 1 and Genesis 3. Uh, we discussed that back a lot earlier. Uh, that can be proven in the fact that in Genesis 1, God told man to multiply, reproduce himself. 
and evidently he's going to obey God's commands, but he doesn't reproduce until Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1, which means there must not have been very much time between Genesis 1, uh, beginning with verse 28, and Genesis 4 and verse 1, which would take us from before the fall to after the fall. No, no animals died, none, not one, none whatsoever prior to Genesis 3. Not a single living animal died. I have to emphasize that, you see. There's no death. Romans 5, 12. Sin entered the world by one man, and death came by sin. So there's no animal death. No conscious death. There is, there is plant death, obviously, but that's not a violent form of death. When they ate the plant, uh, that part of the plant died. But that's not included in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. For a complete